Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. My name is Tony Cully Foster. I'm the President and CEO of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. And on behalf of the Council, I would like to welcome you to this author series program. We'd also like to thank our strategic partner, the Ronald Reagan Building and International Trade Center, for the use of the beautiful Horizon Ballroom for all of our public programs. The Council's programs are filmed for tape-delayed broadcast on our weekly national television show, World Affairs Today, which airs Sunday at 3 p.m. on MHC Worldview, the national channel of MHC Networks. After broadcast, it's available globally on our YouTube channel, as well as on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and other social media platforms. A little bit of background on the topic for tonight's uh, author series and its focus on the Persian Gulf. Hands up here who's been to the Persian Gulf with the exception of this man. Yes, good. Well, that means that you've got at least five questions already. <laughs> Excellent, I've got you spotted now. The Persian Gulf has long been an area of political, military, and economic importance to the United States, and in fact, to our world. The Persian Gulf states hold some two-thirds of the world's proven oil reserves. Saudi Arabia is the largest Gulf oil producer, Iran a distant second. The majority of trade between the Gulf states and U.S. is oil-based and accounts for 16% of U.S. petroleum imports. It also includes industrial and defense and military products, for example, in 2015. The U.S. sold in excess of 33 billion in weapons to Gulf countries. In addition to being a strong economic partner, a number of the Gulf nations are a strategic military partner for the U.S. Also, the U.S., as you know, has fought two wars in the region since 1990, and they've been lengthy wars. As a result of conflict resolution and counterterrorism, the U.S. currently has an unknown number of defense bases in Oman, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Kuwait, and Iraq. The United States has phased its influence from the region in the past few years, so regional powers are stepping in to fill a vacuum. Saudi Arabia and Iran are seeking to expand their spheres of influence in both war-torn Syria and Yemen. To, pro to provide a global perspective on the history and current status of this region, we are delighted to have with us tonight Dr. Roby Barrett, scholar and Gulf expert, who will present on the Gulf and the struggle for hegemony. He states in his book, that in order to predict the future of the Gulf with any degree of certainty, one must be familiar with the history of the Persian Gulf, or we will repeat and not learn from past lessons that we should have learned. Tonight, Dr. Roby will discuss the intricacies of the Gulf security system between the Arabian Gulf and the West, and how it has impacted the stability and modernization of the Gulf region. And now, my honor to introduce our speaker. Dr. Roby Barrett is a non-resident expert on Gulf affairs at the Middle East Institute here in Washington, D.C. Dr. Barrett is also a senior fellow at the Joint Special Operations University of the U.S. Special Operations Command. He has 40 years of government business and academic experience in the Middle East, including acting as a foreign service officer in multiple locations across the Middle East. Initially trained as a Soviet and Russian specialist, 
Dr. Barrett holds a unique perspective to the renewed competition between the United States, China, and Russia in the Middle East and Africa. With all of that said, please give a warm World Affairs Council, Washington DC welcome to Dr. Roby Barrett as he comes to our podium tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, the presentation tonight is built around the book that I have just published. And the reason it's built around the book is because it takes a different perspective on the Gulf from what you normally hear from Gulf experts. Normally, we look at the Gulf and we look at what's happened in the context of the last few years or since World War II. We talk about 1945. We look at the Gulf, we look at the oil production, we say these states are oil states, this is how they got here, et cetera, et cetera. I've been for a decade working in the Gulf. I've taught at Saudi War College. Um, I was stationed in the Gulf, Yemen, uh, and Jordan uh, uh, over, a short, over a relatively short foreign service career, about seven years. And then I've been in business out there for 30, 35 years, mostly defense, security, et cetera, um, because of my uh, expertise and because of really what their needs are. And so what I've learned is that there's a much deeper perspective on the situation today. It's not just oil. And it's not just, it's not just the uh, uh, what happened in the last two weeks or what happened since 1979 and the Khomeini revolution in Iran. There is this long, long history of competition, sometimes conflict. And it's almost as if the region is in its own conflict with the West involved. And so sometimes the West ends up on one side and, one, and sometimes on another. So when I started constructing these studies for U.S. Special Operations Command back about 10 years ago, I was doing the individual studies and it suddenly dawned on me that what was here was the potential to write one big work that not only was, had policy and analysis implications, but could be a reference work that when you put it on the shelf, if you wrote it in a, in a certain fashion, 25 years from now, it would be 90 or 95% as valuable as it is today. And so that's what I've attempted to do. So what I'm going to start off by doing is first describing why I organize the work the way it is and showing you how it's organized. And then I'm going to discuss what the key themes are. And once we get into the themes, you'll get a much broader perspective on how to view what I think is the proper view of the Gulf, and that is the deeper historical context. Today's reality within the historical context of what's happened there. And then from that, think about the future and what it'll look like. So let me get started. First thing I want to show you is what the table of contents looks like in the book. There's an introduction that talks the Gulf through the prism of the past, there's Saudi, a section on Saudi Arabia, about five chapters. Each of these are about these sections are about 100 pages long, or a little bit more. There's the Gulf Emirates. Uh, there is Oman, the Sultanate of Oman. There's a section on Iran, ideology, illusions, and interests. A section on Yemen, uh, and then Syria, Iraq, and then finally the conclusion pulls together the Gulf past as present, present as future. The argument being. You cannot understand the present if you do not understand the deeper past. And if you don't understand the present, you don't have a prayer of being able to project into the future about what is likely to come. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about parameters within which things occur. I'm not talking about day after tomorrow, some incident happens or something happens. Those are... Those are, when the analysts get those right, it's a stroke of luck on, on that. But I'm talking about a context within which things happen that allow you to always be within the ballpark when you're thinking about analysis or policy. So when you structure a comprehensive study, 
first thing I do is I explain in here each of the polities that I just laid out in terms of their unique development. Now, what does this mean? They're all Muslim, right? But they're all different kinds of Muslim. In other words, Saudi Arabia is part of, is, is in large part, uh, the ideology is that of the Wahhabi reform movement of the 18th century and the marriage of that to the El South. So there is a description in that one about how that is linked to the present, that development, the, the emergence of uh, Wahhabi Islam. In Oman, it's the last of the great Herajite states, meaning the third form of Islam. You had Sunnis, you had Shias, you had Herajites. The last place where Herajites actually rule anything is Oman, the Abadis. Well, that is an Islamic state, but it is rule, it comes within the context of the emergence of Abadi uh, Islam, and it's different from, from that of Saudi Arabia. When you look at Iran, you have the experience, obviously, of the emergence of Twelver Shiism, but it wasn't a straight path to get there. At one time, Iran was, by and large, Sunni. But there was a forced conversion in the, uh, 15th, 16th, in the 16th century. And so each one of these things are explained within the context of, of uh, Islam being an ideology, and are explained within the context of their own development. So, you can pull each one out, read the story, it stands independently, and yet they're interlinked. Uh, the other thing that I've really tried to do is I try to look at this from their perspective. I've spent an awful lot of time with Arabs and people in the region. Uh, I speak Arabic pretty well, and it gives me an advantage in the things that I do, the things that I know, and the discussions that are had. And so what I've tried to do is wipe away the Western prejudices that we bring to whatever we, when we talk about human rights or we talk about political process or we talk about political representation, that means something entirely different from when people in the region talk about it. And so I've tried to take that out of it and I've tried to make the book discuss the issues first in terms of how the actors see it and not how we see it or bring our prejudices to it. Um, the other thing that I've tried to do here is I've tried to create a reference work, a long-term reference work that somebody can put on the shelf and use. This is going to be a limited publishing run. Uh, it's, going to, it's 720 pages. It's not something you're going to carry around in your suitcase to read. Uh, it, it has in-depth, real footnotes. None of this, no, go look at the back and try to see what it says. Nobody does that. It's got a real footnote at the bottom of the page. It's got, uh, it has uh, a table of contents. It's highly detailed. And even when you get into the sections and then the chapters, the chapters are broken down by subheadings within, uh, so you can actually go to a chapter and find a real subheading and read on the topic. And so one of the purposes is to create a reference work that'll be valuable, not just now, but 20, 25 years from now, is what, what I've attempted to do. Now, here's the most important thing. I'm not really that interested in what somebody, although I'll discuss it at great length with you, <laughs> what someone thinks about the Gulf. I'm much more interested in how someone thinks about it. In other words, this book is all, this book is pointed to, and my, my, I've been doing these briefings for the military now since, I don't know, it seems like forever. What I'm interested in is how you think about it in this deeper context looking forward that connects the gulf that we know to the 18th century, which is really when it came into being. Every dynasty out there came into being in, uh, in the 18th century. So they all... 1744, 1765, 1785, I can go down the list. Every one of them, and they're still there, okay? So what I'm really interested in is how you think about it and come forward, this idea of past as present, present as future, because I think that's really what puts you in the ballpark on being able to look at it and understand what may, in fact, come next. Um, 
Then, of course, the referencing and footnoting, as I mentioned. But the other thing that that allows is when you're looking at it, there is a real selection of sources there. There are original sources out of the British archives, out of the Australian archives, out of, uh, <coughs> uh, out of Cairo, out of our archives, everything you can imagine. Interviews, there were interviews of people that were particularly from the 50s and 60s. And so it allows you to look at the thing and if you want to know more about a topic, to dig into that topic using it as a guide. Now, let's talk about the Gulf security system. 1763, the British end up winning what we call the Seven Years' War, uh, what the, we here in America call the French and Indian War, and what uh, Mr. Pocock has called the First World War, the first truly global war. And so what happens is India eventually becomes the uh, jewel in the crown of the empire, and it has to be protected. And that means that the British continually expanded their presence into the Gulf and eventually built a Gulf security system. And then oil was discovered late in the 19th century, early 20th century. The Royal Navy shifted from coal to oil, and guess what? It became strategically critical for the Br British Empire to maintain the security of that region. Then the British withdrew. Budgets, everything else, the fact that they just could not maintain it and they had lost their position to a point that, that they really didn't control the oil supplies anyway. So by 1970, the British are completely out of the Gulf and we inherited it. And guess what? We had no idea what to, look, uh, what to do with it. We floundered, literally, from about 1970, well, probably from the announcement in 67, 68, but we floundered for somewhere between eight and 10 years trying to figure out what was our role, what did we want to do, et cetera, et cetera. The Gulf was in very similar shape. And then along came Mr. Khomeini and his revolution in Iran, and it kind of focused everyone again, on how important that was as an oil resource, not just to the West, but to the global economy. And so the Arabs themselves decided that they would put together and try to cooperate too. And it's a fledgling thing in the early 80s, and it's, it's, more, it's more assertive now, but the Gulf Cooperation Council. And really that arrow should go both ways because it's a, it's a mutual kind of relationship. We have bilateral and we have multilateral relations with everybody in the region. But the entire effort here is to continue that basic Gulf security system that was begun by the British in the 18th century. Because the entire British system up until about the middle of the 19th century was, was focused on one principle. And that was you could fight on land as much as you wanted to. You could fight among the tribes as much as you wanted to. But if you put your foot in the water or got in a rowboat and went out and threw rocks at someone, then all of a sudden this was an issue for the British Empire to decide and adjudicate. It's called the maritime peace. Okay? And so, in effect, what we've done is we're trying to ensure, now it's gotten much more complex with missiles and aircraft and all sorts of things, but what we've done is we are really trying to maintain something akin to a maritime piece in this Gulf security system that ensures the flow of oil out of the region. Um, so if you look at the contemporary conflicts that we deal with right now in the region, almost all of them have their origins in that 18th century experience. Safavid Iran was one of the most powerful empires that ever existed and it collapsed in 1722. And based on its collapse and the weakening of the Ottoman Empire, the independent states emerged in the region. And most of the conflict since then has been about that transition in one way or another. There's three themes that you need to understand when looking at it. If you look at the three types of polities, and I use polities as opposed to states because I'm not sure that our view of a Westphalian state is all that accurate anyway. Three types, you have traditional authoritarian, 
What that means is emirates, monarch, and monarchies. Those states have been able to transfer power more or less uh, in a stable fashion because of legitimacy. And it's mainly because the rulers claim a mantle of Islamic legitimacy, whether or not others want to argue with them or not, but they still have this, and so they've been able to transfer power. Um, the U.S. always has a problem with this, is why, shall, why don't the Saudis or the Emiratis or the Bahrainis adopt our versions of human rights, of representative government? Shouldn't everybody, one man, one vote? I mean, how'd that work in Iraq, okay? So shouldn't that be the way the system works? Instead of saying, how is government, how is representative government uh, maintained within their traditional system? Fa uh, through patronage and through, uh, through various groups and, and how they are, the groups are represented in the society. And I'd love to quote Sir Charles Johnson, who was the last, one of the last governor generals of, uh, of Aden, former British ambassador to uh, Amman, because in the 50s and 60s, he would get apoplectic about U.S. policy in the region. And his quote was, the Americans should not allow any infantile anti-monarchist prejudices to blind them to this fact. Monarchy is a very ancient and tenacious principle in the Arab world. When we look back at it now, after the 50s, after radical Arab nationalism, after everything that's happened, as one senior Saudi prince put it, yes, the Kennedy administration, even the end of the Eisenhower administration, used to say that Nasser was the wave of the future. And he put it in that deep Saudi, I, I like to think, Southern Arabian uh, accent. He says, where is Nasser now and where are we? Okay? Which is to say that the monarchies actually survived and did better over the longer haul than the so-called Republican states that followed a Western political, that attempted to follow a Western political model that almost always ended up in a dictatorship. The other form of government is the imperial form. You have the great empires, the Mughal Empire, the Ottoman Empire, uh, the great Islamic empires of the 15th and 16th century. But if you look at them, you have an elite and a security military elite that maintains order and holds the empire together. That's the way it's held together. And then they administer each piece according to the kind of local uh, tradition. Iran is still run on that model. You have an elite, you have the IRGC, as the cleric's hole slips after Khamenei, the next cleric will be more dependent on the IRGC than he was. They won't have another Omani for a while. Uh, and what you have is a systematic uh, attempt to control the rest of the population from this elite's perspective. The Shah did it. I mean, everyone would recognize, every, I think, every Iranian or Persian ruler since the Sasanians would recognize the system of rule in Iran today because change the parameters, the way it works is still fundamentally an imperial Persian model. It's also prone to collapse. When we talk seriously about the 20th century in Iran, it's just not 1979. It's 1953, it's 1941, it's 1925, it's 1905. You just go through it, just collapse after collapse after collapse of the Iranians trying to emerge and do, there's a new ideology. It may be Western liberalism in 1905. It may be authoritarian uh, uh, Kamalist uh, approach uh, under the Pavlavi. Then it's a new kind of Shia Islam under Khomeini. Uh, it may have a different label, but it's basically the same system in trying to recreate it. And in each one of these cases, they're trying to recapture what the Safavid Empire lost in the 18th century, which is Iran's proper place, as they view it, as the dominant power in the Persian Gulf. Shah of Iran, the policeman of the Gulf. 
It's not that the Iranians are bad people. If I were IRGC, I would be very upset and pursue a policy to get ballistic missiles and have nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera, because I believe it's my rightful place to be the dominant power in the Gulf, not the Arabs with their Western backing. It's a matter of interest. And then lastly, we have Western secular political forms, nation states, quote, where we try to apply Westphalian models to the region and look at what it got us in Iraq, Syria, Yemen, um, Egypt, remember, it was gonna be a great democracy. It was very exciting, Arab Spring, right? So what, well, why would we suppose that suddenly you'd have a liberal democratic uh, political institutions merge in a country that for 5,000 years have been ruled by a security military elite? Think about it. I'm gonna talk about Saudi Arabia first here. You have a marriage in 1744 of the El Saud political ambition to a new ideology that's a reaction to all, it's really a reformist Islamic movement, perfectly legitimate within the Hanbali school. And what the Saudis did is bent it for their ideological purposes and made it the mantra of the regime. But look at the first Saudi state on this map. Before oil, before anything, out of the desert, they come to dominate the whole Arabian Peninsula, Mecca. They overreached, and the Ottomans would react and um, ultimately destroy the Saudi state in 1818. Left to their own devices, I would argue Saudi Arabia, except for upland Zaidi Yemen and upland Abadi Oman, would probably dominate the entire peninsula, would have dominated the entire peninsula. Ottomans destroyed them. The British threw their lot in, too, in 1819 with some of their allies. But here's what's interesting. Within six years, the Saudi state had regenerated itself. And that's because of that ideological El Saud Wahhabi marriage. Politics and ideology. You can't find that anywhere else in the region where they continually regenerate themselves. And that's because they actually had an ideological mantra to follow. It collapses because of a dispute within the Saudi family. And it was El Sauds that ruled, but they were just fighting with each other with other backers. But by 1902, it's reemerged, and the new leader looks back and he says, we overreached. That killed us with the first Saudi state. We had an inter-family struggle. That hurt us with the second Saudi state. I'm going to try to do neither. And so... Ibn Saud cut a deal with everybody, the British, the Ottomans. He, he was still a loyal Ottoman subject as he was signing agreements in World War I with the British. And his agreements with the British meant that he got gold, guns, and he was required to do nothing against the Ottomans. Because he knew that after the war was over, that's when the real fight started as to who was going to dominate Arabia. So he hoarded his gold, he hoarded his guns, and he waited. What it's been is about oil now, oil, control, and the quest for modernity. People that say there is one reason for stability in the Gulf and one reason only, and that's oil, don't get it. That is a big part of the modernity thing, and it's an important thing to have that kind of resource. But these were real states that functioned before that. And if it went away, I would bet that an El Saud would still be ruling Arabia uh, 50 years from now. But ideologically, guess what would happen? It would take a right turn and become even more conservative Islamically from an Islamic perspective. The other thing is state policy. How do you deal with a very conservative ideology that tends to spin off radical groups. Abdul Aziz did that in 1924 to 1930. The Ikhwan were a problem. Uh, he needed to get rid of them, but they were very popular. 
He couldn't get rid of them until they stepped out of bounds and started killing other Saudis. And then the other tribes got together and said, destroy them, and he destroyed them, 1930. Fast forward to 2001, Al-Qaeda knocks down two buildings. You've got all these problems with radicals. We're complaining because the Saudis are looking the other directions. The Saudis are saying, yeah, but you know, there's a lot of people on the street that are sympathetic, to, not, not necessarily to the act of violent, acts of violence, but sympathetic <laughs> to the attitudes of those people uh, who oppose the way the West acts, et cetera, et cetera. And so we really can't do anything until we've, we've shifted public opinion. When Al-Qaeda started attacking other Muslims in Saudi Arabia, 2004, the Saudi state, just like Abdul Aziz did in 1930, comes down on them and destroys them. The reason AQAP is in Yemen is because if they were in Saudi Arabia, they would be dead shortly. The Gulf Emirates, every one of these emirates, I've done this as a, I pose this as a series of questions of the Mubarak model. I love this about Kuwait. They're talking about Mubarak the Great, who ruled Kuwait from the 1890s to 1915. And when they ask about Mubarak the Great, they say, he is one of the finest examples of Kuwaiti statesmanship in the El Sabah. And the reason is he was a master at getting others to do for him what he could not do for himself. In other words, if the Ottomans threatened him, well, he got the British to back him up. If the Iraqis invade and run you off, you get the Americans and somebody else to back you up. Okay? I mean, these guys are not stupid. They're pretty smart, okay, in the way they run it because they have intertwined their interests so closely with ours that we really can't afford to see them go away. We can be very upset with the El Khalifa over there, over what they've done in Bahrain. But because they have the absolute backing of Saudi Arabia and the UAE, we can't afford to do too much about it. We can protest and send notes and things. We can do it, but as far as, as really taking action, we really can't afford to. Very, very interesting situation. There are so much that I think is missed of all of the more interesting things that's come from my last decade and a half of really looking at this super intensely, is the migrations, the Utub migration, the fact that the El Sabah and the Halifa moved together first to Kuwait and then, then had a falling out and the El Halifa had to go to actually Qatar. And then all of this is outlined in that book. Each section takes it forward, lays it out, and outlines it and brings it to the present and explains why it is. Oman. There are three Omans, in case you didn't know. There's the Imame, there's the Sultanate, and there's Dofar. There's always struggles for civility. And then there is a body exceptionalism, the only Harajite regime. Uh, there's Omani, a history of Omani re resistance to everybody in the region. There's the rise of the El Busaid, the current ruling family in 1749. And they earned their spurs, their ruling spurs, killing Persians and driving them out of uh, Oman. There's the Canning Award that split Oman. Oman and Zanzibar were ruled by the El Busaid, and the British just came in and split them. Said, Zanzibar, you're going to be independent. But it basically turned Oman, in, it had no way to support itself, into a British dependency even though it was an independent government. And a lot of what's flowed out uh, in Oman since then, the instability, is a direct result of British policy. As one British uh, diplomat put it after they'd had one of their more freakish encounters with reality there, you know, he said, I don't know how in the world we could have been doing intimate business with this place for 150 years, and we have no idea what's happening 30 miles inland. Here's the big question. You've got these three parts of Oman. Sultan Qaboos physically embodies all three. Now, well, here's why I say that. His father was the Sultan. His mother was at least initially an African Sunni Shefahi 
concubine in Salala in Indofar, and that is where Sultan Qaboos was born. So in the great Dofar revolt, in the other revolts, Sultan Qaboos goes and he tells these people, I am one of you. And he's able to put down this revolt that nobody else could with a lot of British help, a lot of Iranian help, a lot of American help, mostly British and Iranian. He's able to put this thing down. And he's able to keep the lid on, and he knows the country very well. Oman is the most authoritarian state in the Arab Gulf. Qaboos is defense minister, prime minister, ruler, head of the National Bank. You go down the list. And he's sick, and he's dying, and he has no heirs. And no one has been trained for that position. There will be a transition, but don't kid yourself. Behind the scenes, the fractious thing that's always affected Oman will still be there, ready to break out. It's a matter of, because it'll have to be a compromised government. When they had the problems in 2011, he came in and said, I had no idea that these people were so incompetent in what was going on, and he fired 13 ministers and changed everything. There will be nobody that replaces him that will be capable of doing that. It's going to be interesting. And this is a topic that the IC is really interested in right now. I've spent a lot of time with them. Iran. The imperial model. I listed all of these rulers here. Every one of them had a unique ideological creation so to speak. Uh, the Sasanian Zoroastrian state becomes pronounced in its ideology only when it's challenged by Christian Byzantium. Ismael II has this strange Sufi mix of seven or Shiism that he introduces that gets his followers to follow him. And then the next group are the 12 or Shias uh, and Abbas. And then Reza Shah it becomes a Kamalist and he's going to turn it in, turn Iran into Turkey. And then Khomeini comes along with his own brand of special 12 or Shiism. All of this is exceptionalism of the Iranians and the Persians trying to set themselves apart from their opponents. Every one of them is backed by an elite military, whether it's the Safaviyya, the Kazilbash, the Ghulams, the IRGC. They're the ones that guaranteed the regime and the ones you have to be afraid of if you're the ruler. If I were an IRGC commander, like I said, my perception of national interest would view the nuclear deal as a temporary measure by which I got some relief from sanctions while I still worked on physics packages and on delivery packages, which is kind of what's going on right now. Because I would see my own stature in the Gulf and my own long-term interests directly connected to having a nuclear weapon. We'll see what happens. And all of this flows from this heritage of humiliation and the extended Qajaria, the Qajars ruled in most of the 19th century and they had concessions to all the Europeans, and et cetera, et cetera. All of this is linked to the situation today, and that's what the section on Iran does. It brings it from there to the present. Now I'm going to give you an example. We're going to go through some examples. Here's Yemen. Here's the last real state in Yemen, this Basulid Yemen from 1229 to 1454. Because if you look at these, these are all the different attempts to turn Yemen into something that could be ruled over about the past, I don't know, 100 years or so. Nothing works because Yemen is not a state. These people that talk about Yemen being a failed state are entirely wrong. It's never been a state. And we've invested a lot of money in trying to, control, uh, trying to construct some sort of federal, centralized federalism or central government in Sanada. It was never realistic from the beginning. You have to look at Yemen not as the UN sees it, like this, on a map, but as this. This is the breakdown. These are just the major groupings, if you looked at it linguistically and religiously. I mean, under this, I spent two years there. You, you can't imagine the hodgepodge. It requires, it's not 
what you think. It's how you think about it, a new way of thinking about it. Ottoman Syria, look at this. Syria and Iraq broken down into all of these provinces under the Ottomans. Each one ruled by separate district ruler or governor, and they managed it according to who was in the area, I mean, who lived in that piece of turf. The British and French get a hold of it, and for colonial purposes, start drawing these lines. They attempt to apply Westphalian theory to the actual Middle East. This is how it kind of looked in the sap of it in the old, in the imperial period. But here you have, and then because the British and French drew these lines, the UN admits these states on the basis of the lines that the colonial powers drew. Got it? So here's what you have. Cream-colored areas in eastern Syria, western Iraq are Sunni. Green in Iraq is Shia. That little red thing are the Alawites who dominate the government in Damascus, and they're around 10% or less of the population. And they're not really Shia. The, they, the Iranians say they are, but they're really kind of, as I would refer to it as, jack Shias. Okay, in other words, uh, really off brand breed. And so nothing according to ethnicity, uh, sectarian uh, uh, belief, or anything else. This is just thrown together, and we're going to have a nation state. We're going to call it something modern, and I'm a Syrian, okay? Except they're still really not. So my question is, should this surprise anybody? Is that the Sunnis feel disenfranchised on both sides and that uh, uh, they banded together? I don't care whether it's ISIS this week or Al-Qaeda, or I don't care if they get rid of ISIS tomorrow. There'll be something else. Because until the Sunnis have their autonomy, they rule this place. This idea that Sunnis are a minority in Iraq is nonsense because the Sunni community as a whole, across the whole Levant, was the majority. And that's the way the pecking order was under the Ottomans. And just because a Brit and a Frenchman go in there and draw a line, they say, okay, now you Sunnis who've ruled the whole thing, guess what? Now, yeah, that was yesterday. Today, you're a minority, and you need to do something about the majority Shia. Are you kidding? It's not going to work. Ignorance of the past precludes grasping the present. Understanding the present is the basis to project the future. Use the parameters of the past because exceptions, when you've got these loose parameters out there, the one-offs that go out like this, are really rare. And the one-offs that are sustained over a long period are even rarer. Okay? It's the Egyptian thing. We've got Sweetness, Enlightened Democracy, 2011, Arab Spring, isn't this wonderful? And we're going to have elections, we're going to do this. Where are they now? Back, back within the parameters of the way the thing was set up originally. All right. Um, it's a framework for analysis. It's not a, this is going to happen tomorrow. It's most likely the events that are going to occur are going to occur within this box as we go forward. Now, let's talk about the Trump administration. There is, a, a friend of mine said, sitting on the second row here, said, well, there's no policy that we can discern. And I com my comment was, well, yes, there's a negative policy that we can discern. We don't know that it's a policy, I remind you. It's, it's really that when they did the, quote, ban, okay, they banned everybody except the people that pulled off 9-11. Okay? In other words, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, the entire Arab Gulf, and I believe this is a good thing, okay, the entire Arab Gulf was excluded from that ban, which tells me that Tillerson and Mattis are at least having some say with the people that are challenged, okay? 
because no matter what else happens in this world, and Tillerson knows this better than anybody, no matter what else happens in this world, if something destabilizes the Arab Gulf and that 20% of the world's oil reserves in Saudi Arabia somehow are no longer dependably, no longer dependable, you're going to be paying six, seven dollars a gallon for gasoline. And the Western economies are going to take it right on the chin. Our real interest in the Middle East is the, is the stability of the Gulf and their ties to the West. We can talk about other obligations we have out there. Those are obligations of a political and sometimes cultural nature. Our real interest, hard interest, lie in the Arabian Gulf. And I had someone this morning at the State Department ask me, well, what about a replacement for them? There is no replacement. It's certainly not Iran with Iran's history. It's not just hostility. It's history of instability. Iran blows up on a regular basis in a historical sense. You can't rely on Iran being there next week because it's going to ch it's too dynamic. It's that old imperial system. Policy minimum, I think, is a continued Gulf security system. That link between the West, the Arab Gulf states, and uh, including Saudi Arabia and Oman. Um, now, the question is, it's going to require, that things are going to get really dicey and things are going to get very interesting and it's going to require this administration to thread a few needles and we'll see if they can do it. In the foreign policy arena, they've come out with really three strong uh, people, potential, and, and one that's a little less known, but, but that should be able to uh, absolutely understand the global situation in, in the form of the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, and the new National Security Advisor. Questions? I'll hit this. Okay? Yeah. On oil, did the British, uh, Bruce Houston, uh, old history teacher, uh, did the British and French draw the uh, lines based on oil, and why can't we just buy the oil today on the world market? On the world market. Here's the way it works. We can buy the oil. The British and the French have a similar interest in oil. But it, it's a global economy on oil. And so if, you, if there's instability in one area, if, for say, for some quirk, the Iranians tried to close the uh, Straits of Hormuz, or there was some other kind of problem, or massive unrest in Saudi Arabia. What that will do is, it's a global market, so you take that out of it, the risk is added, everything goes straight up. And so it's, yeah, you can buy, you will we'll probably be able to get the oil, but the, but the guys out in Pecos, Texas, and the guys up in the Bakken in North Dakota aren't gonna sell it to you so that your gas is $2.17 a gallon, because that's not the global price for it, because the new global price for it will be two or three times that. And so this idea of energy independence and stuff that we hear politicians, that is just po political nonsense. They flat don't understand how it works. Now I promise you, Mr. Tillerson knows how it works, okay? But it's not gonna make any difference. I mean, if it happens in one place, it happens globally. Yes. Could you speak a little bit about, we read so much in the, every now and then in the papers about the, uh, the money coming from the Gulf states going to ISIS, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Um, what, what is the role there? The, the, they're supporting the Sunnis or, or what, what? Can you talk a little bit about that? Here's the deal. The Gulf Arabs, particularly prior to 9-11 and even after 9-11, there's an enormous amount of wealth there, enormous amount of wealth. And we're talking about individual wealth. And nobody was policing the charities, nobody was doing any of this. And so you had people that had real sympathies with these people in the Gulf. Now, I think they were idiots, quite frankly. And the reason is they would be the first target of a lot of these people. But nevertheless, they, for one reason or another, uh, uh, misplaced Islamic devotion, something else. They, 
They really believed in this, and so they handed money out. All of the governments of the region cracked down on it, and so that has been significantly reduced, and the, uh, and the uh, outflow going to radical organizations has been reduced. But I will say this. You can go back to the 19th century, and one of the biggest uh, bones of contention between the British and the El Halifa in Bahrain was the fact that the El Halifa were running guns to the Afghan rebels and the, uh, and the rebels in what is now the northwest provinces of uh, India, now Pakistan, and the British wanted that trade cut out. This is an endemic problem that's been there forever and ever and ever. One reason Kuwait is, a th it, Kuwait is actually a third the size that the El Sabah claimed in the aftermath of World War I. And the reason is, at the beginning of World War I, the El Sabah were taking British protection and they were trading with the Ottomans and with the El Rashid and with the El Saud. They didn't care. And they were claiming protection from the British. And the British got pretty upset about it. So when it came to negotiating their new border and Ibn Saud, they didn't let Kuwait go away. But Ibn Saud said, this is what I want. The British said, OK. And the El Sabah had nothing to say about it. Two thirds of what was Kuwait went to, went to Saudi Arabia. So yes, you're right. Are they doing better? Yes. Will that ever be totally stopped? The answer is no. You can't do it. Yeah. All throughout your, um, your speech on the book, you, talk, uh, you were talking about Ira um, Iraq and Syria and how it was divided up with the Ottoman Empire, um, with the Sunnis and the Shia. But I did not hear you make any mention to the Kurds. Um, given how prominent the Kurds have become as a movement, um, what well, does the Kurds and should Kurdistan become a nation? Um, what is their place in the Gulf security? Well, here's the issue with the Kurds. Everybody after 1918 thought that Woodrow Wilson really meant that you could have national self-determination. If you really look at the fine print, it was when Woodrow Wilson, who was a devout, uh, well, he was just a racist, okay, about things. You had to be qualified. You had certain qualifications before you deserved to have national self-determination. And that included no one in the Ottoman Empire. Didn't even include the Slovaks. That's why you had Czechoslovakia as a result of it, okay? And so, so when you look at that now and you look at it, I think that we've already had a partition of, of Iraq and that the Kurds, as far as a state, is problematic because of the implications that it has for Iran and Turkey. But the Kurds as an autonomous zone that basically run their own affairs, that's a different matter. And I think that the United States, if they wanted to look at this in a more sophisticated fashion, might determine that you could get an awful lot of leverage on some people that you're having difficulties with, whether they're in Baghdad or whether they're in Tehran or whether they're in Ankara, by holding that Kurdish trump card back and using it. And so, yeah. But I really believe you've had this fracturing. And so you have the Shia state that matches that diagram of what the, what the Safavids controlled four, 300 years ago, okay? You have the Shia state in the south. You have something has got to be done to give the Sunnis autonomy so you're not trying to cram Sunnis back into the Alawite bag or back into the, uh, the uh, Shia bag in Baghdad because that is not going to work. And frankly, if 90% of the world is Sunni, what in the world are we doing picking a fight with this element that, that, you know, and the Gulf is Sunni, what are we doing picking a fight with the very element that ultimately we're going to have to get along with in a greater way than anybody else? Good evening. Um, I saw on one of your last slides when you were talking about the Trump administration that you expected them to take a more aggressive stance towards Iran, and I was wondering... Um, Outside of making statements like Iran is on thin ice, um, uh, yeah, what, what or Clausewitz with soft, <laughs> <laughs> okay, is that it? Special operation. So, um, outside of making statements like that, um, I was wondering how exactly you expected them to take a more, what actions they might take that you would deem more aggressive than, say, the Obama administration. I, I think the answer is soft. Look, every time we put a big footprint, what I call the when we put a big footprint on the ground and we have to have DXs and Burger Kings and all that other stuff, okay. It doesn't work. 
the reason SOF was created was to be able to deal with situations like this, greater or violent. So, so the issue is not, there's not a military solution to this. But I'm really tired of people saying, okay, you've either got to have a diplomatic or military. That's not true. Your political solutions, if you go back and look at Clausewitz, a political solution includes the whole spectrum. The reason you couldn't get any leverage is because everybody knew what the Obama administration's answer was to military intervention. And I'm, listen, Iraq was a gigantic mistake, okay, a gigantic mistake. There is a middle path here. I would argue that in 2013, had we just done what we're do, having to do right now vis-a-vis -vis Iraq and Syria and ISIS, we might not have had a, an ISIS problem the size of what it was, and we might not have had the slaughter that we have watched in Syria for the last four years. Do you see what I'm saying? So, so I think that a more balanced policy, but that comes back to my statement about threading the needle. It is a hairline step to go down that slippery slope where you're trying to fix it with the military. And I think Mattis has been down that slope. I think the new National Security Advisor has been down that slope. All those guys have been down that slope, and they're going to be really reluctant because in the end, when you start one of these, especially if it's a big presence, it's always the military that has to do it. Honestly, the foreign policy organs aren't equipped to do it. You say, um, State Department, except when, it, when you're having to get shot at, your people are there, but you're having to send them in armored columns to go visit somebody. It's the military that's out every day with things. And it, it, honestly, it can't be done. There's no big capital S solution. It's a pot, the water's boiling, the water's boiling, you're trying to turn the gas down on it, give the Sunnis something to lose to get the lid where it's just simmering and not blowing off, and then you try to use soft to do it. There's not a capital S solution, but there's, it's one of those things that you can't fix, but you can't walk off from it either. The last administration tried that. So we'll see what happens. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.